now again our next chapter begins with a picture of the clockmaker now he had really fabulous hair and a rather dashing moustache okay. this chapter 26 is called sawdust cake and menaces I'll show you that picture in front of his rather oh, menacing looking clocks oh, try and get it right so we'll see what he plans to do the clockmaker strode across the hall of a hundred clocks the heel of his slippers clicked clacking on the polished marble floor. The carved wooden cases of the clocks sighed and whispered, while from behind the glass panels the pendulum swayed, the cog wheels ticked and topped, and the springs whirred. The faces of the clocks looked down at the clockmaker from the black sockets of their winding keyholes, the spiky clock hands moving slowly across their features. Sound quite scary to me. The clockmaker stepped into the middle of the hall and spread his arms wide. You are all my children, he said, as he always did the minute before the clock struck twelve. And as the hour struck, the hall filled with chimes, a hundred of them, each a different tone and pitch, striking twelve times. The clockmaker knew them all. His clocks had taught him everything, and now the children of the hundred clocks, with their tin bodies, arms and legs, were gathering outside in Clock Tower Square for the Nightingale Parade. The Tin Man Timber Company had been a great success, and with his clockwork army, the clockmaker had been able to dominate Nightingale and the five towns. And that was only the beginning. The trees of the Great Wood were being harvested. The timber mills had never been busier. The furniture makers, palace builders, river wrights and wagon makers were all working to capacity and any wood left over was burned. The furnaces, stoves and hearths blazed. The tang of wood smoke flavoured the air, and the clockmaker had made Nightingale tick. And now it was time to tinker with the workings of trout wine. The Grand Duchess was a fool, and that piper of hers was a hollowed-out wreck. The rats were the ones who called the shots there. They hated tree magic because they feared it. The clockmaker didn't fear it. He wanted to control it. With trout wine in his grip, he would become even stronger, and then he'd deal with the lumberers once and for all. Take the most ancient trees for himself and turn them into sawdust, precious sawdust. The hall of a hundred clocks fell silent as the sounds of the twelfth chime faded. Then the air filled with the whirring of wings, and through the high windows, through the bright metallic beetles and their little furnaces fed with sawdust from the most ancient trees, burning fiercely. It powered their metallic wings and their glowing eyes. The clockmaker looked on with satisfaction as one by one the beetles settled on the clock faces and then scuttled inside their keyhole eyes. The tin men outside were fully wound and it was time for the nightingale parade to begin. King Tiberius, Tiberius, pushed away a honey-glazed almond croissant and belched, his whiskers quivering. On either side of him, his rat attendants stepped forward to loosen his embroidered waistcoat and gently massage his tummy. King Tiberius, Tiberius, pushed them away and reached for a teacup and began to slurp its contents down noisily. The Grand Duchess and her ladies-in-waiting watched, appalled. The League of Rats had been tolerated in trout wine ever since their first appearance. The handsome young Pied Piper had charmed the court with his clever performing rodents and their neat little waistcoats. They had danced elegantly, politely, for the fine ladies and conjured gold coins from the pockets for the noble gentlemen. The Pied Piper had also charmed the young Grand Duchess. And it was said, for he and his flutes had never been far from her side in those days. But now he was stooped, with age and rarely seen. His flute was long gone. The rats had long since abandoned him, taking to the sewers and increasing in size and numbers. Now the rats were as big as cats, and they collected payment from every bakery in the city. The Grand Duchess just wanted a quiet life. She didn't really care what went on outside the palace, as long as she was left out of it. 
perhaps that awful clockmaker could do what he'd promised and control the League of Rats, unlike her poor old Pied Piper. The Grand Duchess tatted as she rose from the chair with as much dignity as she could muster and walked away from the trout wine tea ball. Let them eat their cake, she muttered. And then we're going to Euphemia Golden Curls. Euphemia combed out her second best wig and pulled it on over her short raven black hair, just like Ray. She picked up a sheaf of paper from her dressing table and checked her reflection in the mirror. She didn't look too bad, considering her latest little setback, she, she told herself. And there's a picture of the rat, King Tiberius Tiberius, with, ooh, sorry, kind of page there, with the Grand Duchess in the background. The best professional princess in the business, she murmured approvingly, and then frowned. <laughs> but what business? She had been counting on returning to Beam in triumph with the head and possessions of the notorious wrecker of the tree houses, Budley Bristletoe. Then, in the town square, surrounded by cheering market day crowds, she could have started to put her plans in place for Beam. An alliance with the King Rat, Tiberius Tiberius of Troutwine, and the Clockmaker and the Tin Men of Nightingale, in exchange for what she wanted. She would have been the new Grand Duchess of Troutwine. The Society of Giant Slayers, with Euphemia Golden Curls, professional princess at their head, were more than a match for anyone. But things hadn't gone to plan. There was no slain giant to boast about, but Euphemia knew where to find some. They were hiding in the tumble-downs, not bothering anyone. But that was no use to her. She swept back her best second best golden curls and cleared her throat as she raised the sheaf of paper. People of Beam, the giant menace is real. I have seen it with my own eyes. In the society of gi giant slayers must unite to face this threat. Euphemia read aloud with a flourish. Budley Bristletoe is back and this time he is angry. end. Finishing with a rather rousing speech there from Euphemia Golden Curls, planning what she wants to say to the people of Beam in order to turn them against the drag of the giants. And that page, I'll do that in just a moment, starts with a different picture. So, we've seen the three children with their cloud horses all going to the different places. We've seen the people of those different places and their plans to unite and make friends with the rats and Euphemia and the clockmaker. But what damage are they going to cut? What damage are they going to cause? And how are the children going to stop them? I wonder.